Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Southern Renaissance. This is uh, Tony Purdue. That's me. And and I've got my special guest here today, Stephanie Jennings. I'm here. She let me come invade her uh, photography space here at uh, Low Mill, which is a really cool area. And uh, I'm I'm just proud to be here. And thank you for doing this, Stephanie. Oh, I appreciate you asking me, Tony. <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, you've done a whole lot in your life. And I know you've done a lot of photography for just different people and just amazing. Some of the stuff you photographed uh, is incredible. Um, but let me uh, ask you, are you from here locally? Yes, so I'm actually, I was born here in Huntsville, Alabama. Didn't think I would be back here after living in Philadelphia for 25 years, but here I am. Well, I'm glad you made it back. <laughs> I, I went up north for a while. I was living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I did. I was thinking, well, I might be up there for a while, but I had to come back. It's like it draws you back in. So uh, Apparently, apparently it does. It's like a vortex. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, uh, what was it about photography that attracted you to it that got you kind of into it? The first time that I developed pictures in the dark room in high school, it was like magic. It was just pretty incredible that I imagined a picture in my head. I went and took it and then went in the dark room and did a process with all these chemicals and then watching exactly what I had imagined um, come up on on the sheet of photographic paper. And it just was very exciting. And I just fell in love with it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a, such a different process now <laughs> from back then when you, you had that whole extra steps in there and it wasn't as like instant. Now it's like, I know I do it. I take a million photographs and <laughs> pick out a vault, but you probably... You were just more uh, specific, I guess, what you want. You knew what you wanted and went for it. Yeah. Back in the day, um, every picture was, you know, specifically planned out and it was it was very different. Nowadays, uh, you know, you take twelve hundred pictures to get a couple. Back in the day, it was, you know, thirty six pictures on a roll. And yeah. you got one. So it's different. I, I think it's. I've never really thought about it, but maybe that's kind of changed the um, almost maybe you don't have as many candid shots because people are a lot have that option now to sort through so many things. You think photography is just so different nowadays with people posing for the pictures instead of being able to get realistic shots. I'm it's something people expect now for their picture to be made. Um, it's it's definitely a different different process, and they expect you know a hundred pictures even though they might only want one. And most people nowadays, they never print a picture. You know, all the pictures are digital. They're on their phone. They're on their computer. Um, people don't print pictures. And that's what my studio here, I have a dark room. Yeah. So that's one of my things is, it's you know, printing cool. from the old negatives. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you, you tried to use the old ways of technology earlier before we got on here. I was doing some break dancing moves <laughs> and you were trying to capture it, but I was just too fast. And it was like... <laughs> a fabric in time and space opened up, but you were just like, I just, I can't do it, Tony. You're just too good at yeah. break dancing. <laughs> None of that happened, by the way. <laughs> so I'd like, I'd like that to happen. I think yeah. we might have to do that. Well, I can do some good popping and locking, but like those head spins and stuff, I probably would hurt myself pretty bad. Well, this is the perfect place we can put out some cardboard for you to spin around on. Yeah, like these floors at uh, low mill, they're kind of oiled, right? So that maybe they make you like, it, maybe you would uh, spin too fast, so like it would start like a... Like starting a fire with two pieces of wood. Don't want to start a fire here. See, Not in a photography studio. Oh, yeah, that would be a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> that would be a very bad idea. Now you see why I have this printed out because I'll go on a tangent without these. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't expect anything less. That's right. I did not you know expect me pretty anything well less. Already. <laughs> My brain moves really strange ways that <laughs> synapses and you know the neurons are just firing in all directions that's okay it's okay but um yeah well i tell you what you've we were talking about your photography over the years you've taken photographs of lots of rock stars 
so that was my main focus back in the day in Philadelphia. I wanted to be a rock photographer and I uh, just went for it. I had in college had taken pictures at the fraternity parties, the Black Crows, 10,000 Maniacs, REM um, played on campus and I had taken their pictures and it was just something I really wanted to pursue. So when I went to Philly and all these bands were around. Um, there was so much going on. I just started taking pictures for um, a local magazine. And pretty soon, um, you know, I had a portfolio and I was able to take it to the radio stations, to the record companies, to an agency in New York, um, to the metal magazines in New York. And I started getting published and got an agency representing me and just started doing the MTV Awards, the Grammys, all the things. That's so awesome. Yeah, I've seen the the pics and I'm just like, wow, you've posted a lot of you've shot a lot of people. I mean, uh, just, I mean, I can't even name off of them because I've seen a lot of your, just what you've posted on like the internet and it's crazy the amount of people, especially (laughs) for, I guess, the time period there at MTV. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of like the artist awards, I guess, like Mm -hmm. you say, you said it worked at the Grammys too. Mm -hmm. The Grammys. Yeah. The MTV awards, the MTV movie awards, um, just lots of rock shows that were in festivals back in the day from Lollapalooza to everything that was in New York and LA. And it was a great time to travel around and, you know, take pictures of all these up and coming bands at the time, Metallica, Nirvana, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And it's amazing. Like their music has lasted through today. So it's still exciting that my pictures are still relevant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's cool. Like, like you were saying, it's almost like magic. It's you've captured that one moment in time and you now have that. And it's, it's very cool. I've, I've always been fascinated with that too, just Mm -hmm. images and uh, just capturing that moment. You know, I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to keep it on the down low, but this is actually more anthropology. This, uh, (laughs) this is Southern counterculture anthropology right here. I'm trying to, (laughs) trying to get all fancy but uh but yeah it's just it's just such a cool thing and i know it then the same with music with digital things now it's easy to take for granted what we can do with it it's just so easy to take a billion picks or uh, find any pick now and uh, or music or whatever but it's just a uh, cool thing there's the composition and just uh you know there's there's art to it but there's also it's you're documenting something so it's there's different things going on it's interesting to try and explain to someone um about let's let's say this photo right here of um anthony kiedis with the red hot chili peppers that you know i had to get a photo pass and i had to get you know permission to to go and photograph him and be in the front row and there weren't many other photographers and you know taking the the film home and going into my dark room at my house and developing it that night, printing the pictures that night to get them to the newspapers and magazines the next day. Oh, yeah. um, you know, that was a whole process, which, you know, explaining that to somebody nowadays, it's, it's, um, it's a lost art because yeah. nowadays, you know, people don't understand like what it took to get that picture. They think I saw, um, you know, I had somebody talk about one of my pictures of Cindy Crawford. They thought I must've seen her just walking along the street <laughs> and took the picture with my cell phone and that's how it came about and it's like I was the red carpet photographer you yeah. know um, at an event and you know she posed specifically for that picture and then I had to go home and develop it and yeah. get it out to the magazines um, you know it wasn't where you could just you know went through the internet and ended up mm-hmm. online it was something like uh, tangible that and you actually had to make happen you had to run it through the juices and whatnot. And whatnot. <laughs> I don't want to get too technical, but the juices and whatnot, that's how they <laughs> pretend like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's a- another thing you did, which is pretty wild and really uh, groundbreaking. It was sort of uh, they were pulling the old timey uh, vaudevillian and circus type themes mm-hmm. into the modern day in the 90s. But the Jim Rose 
uh, freak show or Jim Rose sideshow, I guess. Jim Rose circus sideshow. Circus sideshow. Thank yeah. you. I was like, what's the proper <laughs> yeah, name? The Jim uh, you, Rose circus sideshow. You could show. probably see it that I was like, my gears were turned. Okay, what's the proper name, Tony? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, but that was a pretty crazy uh, time. I know you toured with them, right? Yes. So um, I took pictures of them in the 90s. It was, I was fascinated with the sideshow freaks and their, their troop just amazed me and I couldn't get enough. And some of the pictures were just, um, their performances were just absolutely incredible. And then they were on tour with Lollapalooza on the side stage. And it was just pretty amazing that other performers, um, such as the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Ministry and the people would, would get up and be on the stage um, excited to see the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. Yeah. So, and, and nowadays, um, bringing it all back around, I've been photographing the same performers from the original Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. Um, and all of those photos, the old photos went went into a new documentary called The Circus of the Scars, although the book was written in the 90s okay. that it's based on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've gotten to take new pictures of these same freaks. So over this 30 year span, so they're still performing and it's been uh, very interesting. I bet. I, I can't imagine. And I've, I mean, I've lived a pretty crazy life, <laughs> been a lot around a lot of crazy things, but that's they really took it to the limit. Like, um, I mean, you have one guy and it's funny cause you're so used to it. And like, we were setting up some pictures and stuff for the shot, <laughs> some awesome picture. And you're like, yeah, let's go ahead and put, what is his name? Doc, Mr. Torture, Dr. The torture Tor King, the torture, yeah, Tim, you're like, Tim okay. the torture King. <laughs> it's like you were just setting a vase on, we'll go ahead and put the torture King right there. And exactly. It's just, exactly. Just so normal. But, uh, yeah, they yeah. did all kinds of crazy stunt. It, I know I, I I've, I was interested in it when it came out. I remember that and just because I love the, the you know, the crazy over the top circus stuff and just the showmanship uh, too. one of my idols when I was a little kid was Houdini before okay. I even got into music. <laughs> So I, I can get see that. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're like, I, I, I yes. see you're a freak. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. a so long time ago. Yeah. Yep. So that's why we connect. <laughs> that's exactly, exactly. But, but yeah, that's I, what was it? I was seeing. I, I know there was one thing I saw where Jim Rose was like face down in broken glass, and he yes. was letting people from the audience step on him, yes. his head, yes, into the broken glass. Yes, I've got lots of pictures of that. So, and you can see it happen in the documentary. Yeah, I was gonna say I I checked out the trailer. Um, yeah, it looks like an awesome documentary. Um, just crazy. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the stuff they did. And just, I know well, he besides would. Besides the sword swallowing and, um, you know, the state, he would staple the dollar bills to his head and other parts of his body, you know, escape from um, the crazy, the straight jacket. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just all kinds of different things. And. Then of course, Mr. Lifto, yes. lifting, yes. lifting um, all different things from his body parts. Uh, yeah, so. and body parts. We say that like he's. I know he's he's like swinging around some irons, and I mean, I like literal like things you iron with from his nips on part of it, <laughs> and then he's got other stuff going on. So oh, yeah, it's pretty wild. And so he's um, he's actually a bartender. Um, and now, um, but he still does some performing. So I'm looking forward to getting all five of the Marvels together. Um, and we're going to be uh, doing a new photo of all five of them as soon as okay. we can get them together. Very cool. Yeah. Is it true he actually serves drinks with his nipples? Because I've heard that. I think um, I'm going to have to go check that out. Okay. That's, a, that's where okay. the buttery nipple came from, the right? Buttery. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's it's wild. I mean, I what's the most that from what you remember, the most cringeworthy thing that you shot a picture of? Because I feel like it would be hard to hold the camera still on some of that. You'd be like cringing. It's well, the the cringeworthy shot is when um, the 
Matt the Tube Crowley. So he does this thing called gavage. And the gavage is he puts a tube down his throat into his stomach. And there's Jim Rose had a cylinder that he would put like beer and chocolate and Maalox and all kinds of stuff in it and ketchup. And then he would pump that into um, Matt the Tube Crowley's stomach and then he would pull it back out and it would be served up to anyone who would like to drink that Um. and it would be called bile beer and that's where the members I have a picture of Flea drinking the bile oh. beer um the guys for ministry yeah so at, wow. during Lollapalooza it would be a thing to get up on stage and drink the bile <laughs> beer from the gavage uh, now that <laughs> yeah and this is way pre-jackass yes, <laughs> like yes they were they were going hardcore <laughs> Yeah. But it still had that traditional, actual, like the freak show vibe to it. Yes. I know that it was very, it seemed like it was honoring that tradition. It was definitely honoring the tradition. That's what, you know, Jim Rose, he was definitely a ringleader, um, a true salesman, and, you know, um, the world's most tattooed person. And, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, that's just, right. That's the enigma, right? Yes. The, the enigma. And one of my favorite things is that I have pictures of the enigma before he had any tattoos when he was actually called slug. And one of the reasons being is he would eat slugs (laughs) as (laughs) one does. Yes. Yes. Um, but now he is the enigma. Um, and he's the man with all the tattooed puzzle pieces and he actually, tattoos puzzle pieces on people nowadays okay well that's <laughs> he's like i've ran out of skin to put puzzle pieces on i gotta find other pieces of skin yeah. to put puzzle pieces on. and i actually feel like um i am the like world's only untattooed lady but i was uh thinking about letting the enigma tattoo a puzzle okay. piece on me yeah so. that would be pretty uh, i think that would be meaningful yeah we've that had, would be we've been friends all these years and, i was yeah. gonna say especially with your background just <laughs> you you touring and like you say being friends all those years um yeah there's a you got a picture we don't have in the shot of a fella uh i think is that the the mr lifto swinging uh, with his uh genitalia oh yes yes yeah. that of course that's mr lifto okay. lifting with his genitalia yeah. um that one in philly i think he was lifting the liberty bell okay as one does yeah and sw- i mean and swinging it around i mean yes. it's such a tired everybody's done that i mean how <laughs> how many people hasn't lifted the liberty bell with their um junk I haven't. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty unique. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you're in Huntsville, when um, hopefully we'll get them to come here. And what can we have him lift for Huntsville? A rocket. We'll have oh, to get a yeah. rocket ready. There that we go. Be, that would be perfect. I'm right. sure that wouldn't be dangerous at all. <laughs> that weighs how many tons? I bet he could do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think I believe in him. <laughs> He's, uh, he's, yeah, that's one uh, of a kind, one of a kind. I would say like, it takes a special kind of person to just put, subject yourself through that for the, uh, entertainment of individuals. Like, cause none of that was fake. Right. I mean, it they was were all really real. doing all yes. that stuff. That's what, if you watch the documentary, it's, it is very interesting, um, how everything came about and doing the new tricks and getting, well, not tricks, getting the, you know, the, um, doing the stunts um, and just getting more and more extreme and, and what could they do next and, you know, what would be interesting and let's try this. And, you know, um, and with the Torture King, um, you know, he is the human pin cushion. So he literally mm. would have, you know, lots of pins um, all in his um torso and and arms and and putting skewers through through his skin he's a master of pain control that apparently so (laughs) and i've heard i've actually heard of um i don't know if it's uh monks or certain way like you can block it out somehow Mm -hmm. if you have enough control i guess over your um, mind control mind control Mm -hmm. yeah it's so interesting but yeah what I don't I can't even imagine. <laughs> so I just went to um, New Orleans and photographed the sideshow Hootenanny and oh, cool. the Torture King got a lifetime achievement award. Yes, he yes. Should. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he should. Exactly. 
That is wild. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine. <laughs> and what I saw another one. I think is that Jim Rose did this that he would lay on the bed of nails and people would get on him that way, like jump up and yes, down on him. Yes, and the torture king also. Oh man, okay. yeah, that's wow. It is wild. <laughs> Well, it kind of reminds me uh, when I worked in in video and broadcasting, I actually shot some uh, some video for some surgeons <laughs> and I had to shoot some different surgeries. And one was like a, a total hip replacement. And he was having to saw it and like <laughs> hammer it in there. <laughs> and at the time, this was back when a lot of viewfinders were black and white. And I was like, I'm so glad this is black and white. Yeah. And the <laughs> anesthesiologist I remember was like, uh, the first time I did it, he was like, uh, you don't look. And he made me sit down because he saw I was about to pass out, I guess. <laughs> so that that's like... Even worse, but not under the care of a doctor. <laughs> Just, you're like recording it's very, things. It's very interesting being behind the camera um, and watching this stuff. It's just I, the whole sideshow and what they do just has always fascinated me, um, including from sideshows that I caught um, back in the woods of Tuscaloosa. That's where I've got these, you know, small people and yeah, large yeah. people. And I all wondered the, about that. Yeah. That's cool. And they would carry around, you know, the jars with the the two headed, you know, alligator, the three headed monkey, and the in the jars in formaldehyde. Just Man. all of that stuff has always fascinated me. I think um, some of the stuff that fascinated my grandfather, and okay. that's where it would come from. Nice, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, I mean, it's really that's that's on the front. Some people say like, you know. It says the analogy of you're crazy if you're going to go and join the circus, but that's like one beyond. <laughs> that's like there are the to circus the extent, yeah, <laughs> to the full extent. Well, um, I know I just asked you, were there a, a lot of hospital visits with this sideshow? I mean, no, the, no? that's what no, no. I mean, they're um, part of the the troop is that I mean, really taking care to do the things, okay. I mean, safely, which again, um, people trying to do a lot of it nowadays. Um, <laughs> I, I have read about a lot of uh, visits to the ER mm. with some of the performers nowadays. Because okay. um, this was real stuff back in the day. And, yeah. it's, and they train for it. So it, they wanted to make it look chaotic, but they're actually taking a lot of care and yes. studying and yeah. really training. It's one of those don't try this at home, Literally. which I think this autographed picture might one of them says don't try this at home. <laughs> As it yeah. should. Yeah, I'm not going to be fire breathing at, yeah. at home. <laughs> yeah, probably not a good idea. Man, well, um, you know, what, what was the, uh, you've got the, Oh, I was going to say you've got the photography exhibit here at your studio during the month of October. If anybody's listening to this before then, should come by and check it out. You've you've got all your yes. Like got so a few in since here. it is October, it is Halloween. I always put my freak show photos up. Um, these photos from the Jimmer Circus Side Show, in addition to other um, sideshow events that I have photographed. Um, so it's a little bit of a freak show, and I have the slideshow um, of hundreds of photos going in the window. So anybody can come visit Low Mill the month of. October and check out get get your scare on come get freaky yeah. with the freak show <laughs> that is um, it yes I mean I I'm very desensitized and even I'm a little freaked out <laughs> some of these pictures so that's saying something <laughs> that is something right there well um as far as the we would already talked about the circus of the scars that's a documentary how did that so that was the book it was a book for it in the 90s and then they decided they were going to make a documentary correct so it's kind of the rise and fall of the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow okay it's how it gained such popularity and notoriety in the 90s and what caused it to implode and um because Jim Rose does did and still does have a huge ego uh. um <laughs> and so and now with um and it shows the performers where they are nowadays and part of it 
and my pictures, they contacted me and I had all these amazing pictures from photographing um, so often back in the 90s and they used my pictures in the documentary. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. And so hopefully the documentary um, Circus of the Scars, we will be bringing it to Low Mill and getting some of the performers to come. That would, that be, would be so cool. Yes. I'm going to have to come check it out. Yeah. Get so that we'll try and make that happen. Going. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, maybe we get some of those guys on the podcast. That would oh, be cool. yeah. There you go. <laughs> it would definitely be cool. Well, uh, you know, this is I know this is a sensitive topic right here, but um, you being around all these rock stars and stuff for for a little while, you were actually uh, Phil Spector's girlfriend, right? Oh, yeah. So that was uh, that was the an 90s was time. a wild time. Yeah, for me. sounds like it <laughs> sounds like it. Um, so I know that had to have been crazy. Um, how did that come about? You just I guess you meet him because like common people that yeah you knew. I met Phil um, when I was photographing an event in Philadelphia um, the uh, Philadelphia one of the music events and okay. he was the keynote speaker um, and so we met and I ran into him um, a few weeks later in a restaurant uh, it used to be a popular restaurant in New York called Elaine's and I happened to be in there with a friend and Phil was in there with his friends and I just photographed him. So I said, you know, hey, just met you yeah. <laughs> last week. I just photographed you. Oh, yeah. And so he invited me to sit down at his table. OK. And the rest is literally history because it's all in a documentary called yeah. Spectre on Showtime. That's right. And you're in episode three, right? I am. So. Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's it's interesting. It's kind of, I've just thought about this, you know, because I, he put out a lot of uh, good music, some of the stuff he produced with John Lennon and mm -hmm. Be My Baby, mm -hmm. one of the best tracks ever, and just a lot of different things, but you kind of, you realize, well, just because someone's art good, mm -hmm. art is good, doesn't mean they're great people, you know, that's, there's a sort of a thing there that's I hard mean, to... Yeah, a lot of artists, um, it seems like, have um, not only chemical dependency issues, oh, yeah. alcohol issues, but also just um, mental health issues. Sure. So, and back in the day, that wasn't really something that was discussed. Mental health issues um, didn't seem to, nobody ever talked about it. And drug and alcohol use was, um, that's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> It was just, oh, he's eccentric or, you know, he's just amazing. He's a genius. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, you yeah. know, people wanted to work with him and they would let him get away with saying and doing things. And he would just say and do things to the extreme to entertain himself. So he would actually I know he was known for carrying a gun around even yes. in the studio and stuff and like pointing it at people. Right. Yes. That's crazy. I mean, yes. And I didn't know about any of you hear be my baby. You're not thinking, man, that guy's probably holding the gun to somebody's head. But it's, yeah, you don't think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was um, I mean, that was just kind of his uh, by the end of the night after everything, you know, everybody was having a good time and then things would just go bad at the end of the night. Yeah. Almost every time. Oh, man. So you, you think it was a, a mental, a combination of mental health things and then just the substance abuse. And the ego. And the ego, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, that many people, he was probably, I get the feeling that he was probably insecure and then that many people building up constantly mm -hmm. like that. It was like, it made him feel like, oh, I'm somebody, you know. And he it was just always to the extreme and he was definitely paranoid it's that somebody was always out to get him. One of his famous quotes that he would say to me was just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not out to get you <laughs> oh man wow that's an interesting <laughs> quote there um yeah so if, if anyone doesn't know which mo most people do I, I know he was convicted of murder for uh oh gosh lana clarkson lana clarkson thank you and uh so he was convicted of that and put in prison and you were there and you testified against mm -hmm. him right that's so i know that had to have been hard for you um just it was a super super stressful time um 
flying back and forth to L.A. from Philadelphia, you know, trying to keep my life together, but having to go to the grand jury um, and testify and, you know, deal with um, all the show's hard copy and everything. It was pretty crazy time. And then um, when the trial did come around, it was a mistrial, the first one. So having to go through it all over mm-hmm. again um, was pretty horrifying. And um I'd had a car accident in between and, you know, my looks from partying and everything um, was brought up at the trial and there were blogs about things. So it was a really, it was a very stressful, um, not a very good time. Mm -hmm. I bet. Yeah, that's, I I couldn't imagine uh, dealing with that. Would you... Did you, I know you were, you were so used to being around crazy people. Yeah, that. You're, it was normal and it was sort of your baseline. Yeah, so that, that yeah, like with the guns and everything, my family, like everybody always had guns. So that didn't bother me and I didn't think of it being um, normal people don't really carry guns everywhere they go and are paranoid. Yeah, I got you. That makes sense. Yeah, it's um, but you did you ever feel just scared or threatened? Like you just felt like, hey, I don't want it. Yeah, and that's what um, why I was involved with the trial because yeah. he had pulled a gun on me and Oof. I did call 911 because I did feel threatened for my life. And that call was still, uh, you know, after he had murdered Lana Clarkson, that call was um, a piece of evidence showing a pattern okay. of behavior. Um, the 911 operator, you know, was there to, you know, testify about it. And most people had not called 911 want to reported what happened but this was I had actually reported it and so there was a record of his past behavior mm. in addition to um, all the threatening messages he had left me oh. on my answering machine and I happened to still have that tape in my old answering machine mm. so um, they were able to to use that as a pattern of behavior that's good yeah he, I know that was hard but at least you were able to put some justice there to that whole thing yes so at least um, you felt probably I, I do I feel I was um you know that happened um for them the detectives to con find me and contact me um for a reason I remember Lana Clarkson's mother um hugging me at the trial and thanking me for coming forward but I I didn't voluntarily come forward they found me but I felt like I was very glad that I reported the things when it happened yeah um so you know I did my part yeah absolutely and that's that's uh takes a lot I know, I know that had it been hard I- yeah he had actually called me after um that it all happened that I'd called the police and he had wanted me to come photograph Celine Dion in Vegas that he was working on an album which um he later I believe they fired him and I don't think any of the songs he helped you know produce um went anywhere but yeah I um said absolutely not yeah that i was yeah. that was enough no, i wasn't going to put myself in that position again yeah exactly so i don't blame you <laughs> yeah yeah i just oh, man he was so he Although was i would have liked to photograph celine dion she's one sure. pe- she's one person that i haven't yeah but again i wasn't going to trade my life for that right exactly. <laughs> the context yeah yeah you made the right decision <laughs> yep for sure well, um, you know, that's, I mean, he, he actually has passed away since then, obviously. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people know this, but just people that don't know the whole story, he has passed away. I guess he passed away in a jail, mm-hmm. prison. I believe during COVID. And that <laughs> felt, I guess that felt like you had closed that chapter in your life. It yes. felt like, a re- do you feel a relief? Oh, I definitely feel happen? a relief. Um it's weird how things, you know, come back. And just like the documentary with Spectre, um, the reason I agreed to be involved with that is because they were showing and talking about Lana Clarkson and what um, a great person she was and the That's life cool. that she yeah. led. And, you know, she didn't deserve to, to die like that. And, you know, I, I 
appreciated how they were bringing and concentrating on her as a person. Yeah. And also, you know, in showing a lot of Spectre's background that a lot of people didn't know with um, the mental illness and different things in his family with his father committing suicide mm. and what he grew up with. Yeah, I really, I mean, and I, I'm a music lover and I, I listen to a lot of the music he produced, but I, I watched the documentary. I didn't know a lot of that. I just thought like a lot of people, oh, he's just a quirky guy. Mm. I but thought it no. was a great documentary. I was yeah. really, um, you know, I wasn't happy to have to listen to the telephone uh, messages that he had left oh, for me yeah. over and over again uh, while they were filming. That got pretty distressing. I but bet. Um, but in the, you know, the film, the documentary was well done and I I appreciated all the attention they gave to Lana Clarkson. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I see how they did that. And I, it seems like a lot of documentaries like that, and there's so much like true crime stuff out there mm -hmm. now. And it's sort of, it almost feels like victim blaming sometimes, but they yeah. did the opposite on that. Like Correct. you say, it was like. Which some previous movies that were about Spectre, um, I believe the one Al Pacino played in, oh, um, yeah. you know, they, they highlighted Spectre and, you know, um, left out the true victim and what had happened to her and that she didn't deserve that. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's. That's a great point. Yeah, I didn't. Even, I didn't even think about that, but that that makes a lot of sense. Um, so the really important thing about all this is what is up with those goofy wigs he wore in that. <laughs> what was oh he thinking, man? He, those giant wigs. That what like, wigs? What wigs? Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah he, he he wasn't bald. He never right? <laughs> admitted to ever wearing a wig, ever that's or lips so weird. or things. Yeah, that's that, so weird. Yeah, it's just I don't understand that. I don't know if anybody ever will. That's yeah, that's very interesting. I guess he just lived in his own reality and didn't. I think when you're, you know, a genius at 17 and revered for your your work and you make so much money. Yeah. And, you know, um, it just you can push the limits and you just keep pushing them and pushing them. <laughs> Yeah, you feel like you can do what you want. Exactly. And, you know, back in the day, people could do what they wanted oh, in, yeah. in the music world and in Hollywood. Um, you know, people did do what they wanted. Nobody was ever called out on anything or, you know, again, mental illness and substance use um, was not talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, it seems like we're at the 60s up to the... 70s and 80s was pretty crazy. <laughs> well, in the 90s, obviously, <laughs> as you can attest to, I'm yes. sure. <laughs> yes. What a long, strange trip it's been. Yeah, right? exactly. That's, oh man. I, I mean, I, my life has been pretty wild, but that is, yeah, you, <laughs> you've lived a, a full life. That is for sure. Well, um, let's see. I asked you about the goofy wigs. <laughs> 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 well, let, let's go uh, pivot to something, uh, uh, another thing that's kind of serious is when did you decide to get sober? So, um, December 27th, 2014 is cool. my sobriety date. And so that's eight and a half years ago. And, um, you know, it, it kind of, I couldn't continue to live a crazy lifestyle. Yep. Um, my mental health, um, my physical health, um, I was just not doing well. And, you know, a lot of it could have been contributed to some of these, you know, factors of being, you know, so stressed out over the trial situations and different things happened, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, I mean, I was part of all of it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I understand. Well, I, I think we share that in common because in 2014 was when I got sober. Okay. It was like August uh, 20, uh, 2014. That's when I started getting sober. But as far as me, it feels like, like you say, it's, it's sort of like I was self-medicating. There was some trauma there. Mm -hmm. And once I got to the root of that, that's how I was able to. You know, mm -hmm. it, but you have to make that decision for yourself ultimately. And it's, it's hard, but, but the cool thing is, and the great thing is, and it's, you know, all this stuff happened, but you're a survivor, you've been through all mm -hmm. that stuff. And now you're helping out other people, help them get sober. And you're, you're helping with this. Uh, tell me about the, the house. So um, it's called Best Life Recovery, and it's a women's sober living home here in Huntsville. And so there is eight women at a time. 
and I live with the women and my two cats at the house. And it's in a very safe neighborhood in Huntsville in walking distance to jobs. Um, and it's just, you know, helping women that are coming out of detox and treatment and jail and letting them come into a very safe environment with other women that are trying to, you know, build a new life in sobriety and be a part of the community and get their, you know, start working and being able to get back on their own. That's so cool. That's, I know that, you know, when I was trying to get sober, it would, I had to finally uh, let go of my ego and mm -hmm. accept help. That mm -hmm. was part of it because I'm always, no, I don't want any kind of help, but that's where I had to just completely be like, no, I need help. And then I realized one of the things that keeps me sober is helping others. Correct. Yes. So it's like, it was like this hack finally. <laughs> oh, that's how you, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then you're focusing on helping others and you're not in your head. And yeah, so it's, I think it's, um, you know, AA was helpful, but like I say, I feel like the, the psych psychology of it and just what was causing me to, uh, abuse things in the first place is what really helped me. That's was the like the key and then just constantly trying to, you know, it's like they say a day at a time, but um, but yeah, that's, I just really appreciate what all you've overcome and just who you've become. You, I know it was always there, but now you, you just help so many people. And I, I think that's really something to be admired. And uh, if more people were that thoughtful the world would be a lot better place. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Nowadays, uh, people are not too kind. Which yeah, you can, you yeah. see and that all the time on yeah. the internet. <laughs> Absolutely. And you see it in everyday life. I mean, it's it really takes nothing to open the door for someone, yes. to smile at someone, to pay it forward with a coffee. Um, or if you see somebody that looks like they're having a bad day, to, to ask them about it. I do like to test people. I like to just scowl at people when they come in a coffee <laughs> shop. I just want to freak them out. No. <laughs> no, you're totally right. It's just, and I try to, you know, I try to do the best I can, you know, to be helpful and to be nice to people. Just be, mm -hmm. I feel like no one is better than anyone else and everyone deserves respect unless they show that they don't, you know. <laughs> but, uh yeah, I just and everybody and before I had my issue um, there, I had a different mindset. I was like, well, just stop. Just don't do it. You know, why are you why are you not just and I'm like, mm. It's then not I was that like, easy. No, it's, it's not, not that, that easy that's to not just how it stop. Works. And it's also dangerous. And, yeah, you know, exactly. Once your brain becomes addicted to certain substances, you cannot stop on your own. You do need medical help. Yes. So, and for me, I was told um, that I was just, you know, um, self medicating mm -hmm. also. So I was like, oh, that's all it is. I'm just self medicating. Yeah. Um, but once, you know, I just could not seem to function. And it wasn't fun anymore. Yeah. Um, I, you know, sought out um, actually going to a meeting, you know, was where I started. Um, and I have to say, you know, working the 12 steps. I mean, everybody yeah. could use the 12 steps. It's oh, just a sure. good way to live life as the 12 steps. Yeah, I think it, I think it is a good uh, it just simplifies things as far as is just give you a systematic way of thinking in a non toxic <laughs> kind of way so mm -hmm. i think it is very good and, and also accepting responsibility for your behavior you yeah. know just because i did have trauma in my past doesn't mean um, i have to continue to abuse myself or others yeah. um you know my my part in that would be continuing to relive the trauma instead of getting to the root of it and getting through it and over it i mean it wasn't my fault things that happened to me when i was young um but it's up to me to want to live a better life and if I stay in, in that self-pity mode um, then that's never going to happen yeah. and so you know accepting that um, for me you know if you want to look at it in terms of like I'm allergic to alcohol yeah. um, as oh, yeah. you know as some people would like to say every time they do a drug they break out in handcuffs oh yeah heard that um, one. yeah yep. but that so you know I do not react normally to you know alcohol or drugs like other people mm -hmm. um, kind of like if somebody's allergic to strawberries yeah. Um, and so, you know, that I have to figure out a way to live my life without that. And in today's world, I mean, alcohol is so acceptable. Mm -hmm. You 
drink alcohol to celebrate. You drink alcohol to, you know, if you're sad, yeah. if you're happy, um, you know, when you hang out with friends, you go to anybody's house, you bring some wine and it's everywhere in the stores and the commercials. And it just looks like a glamorous life. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's what if everybody thinks instead mm-hmm. of normalizing like alcohol is a poison and yeah. you know if um, you don't do it in moderation the things that can happen and I don't know a lot of people that you know normally do it in moderation yeah I can't I mean I can't think of many <laughs> um, yeah it's I, and I'm the way my personality is I'm on or all or nothing I have a switch not a knob so it's like okay this is either on or off and so I just yeah I can't do that and 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 the rehab I went to it was that's kind of what they they talked about you know it's act like you're saying it's an actual chemical thing there that happens that creates that so it's not like a uh as easy as uh, well, just don't do it. <laughs> it's right, not how right. it works. It's, yeah, well, there's reasons. What Nancy Reagan just you know? Say oh no. yeah, just, just say no. Just like, say no. It's yeah. Easy. So so how are you supposed to say no to a drink when it's advertised everywhere? When that's yeah. what what's that's what society has normalized. Exactly. So in trying to make it normal to say no, that it's okay. Like you know, because I know I couldn't believe when you know somebody didn't drink. Like that doesn't sound right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's how I grew up is that everybody drank and mm-hmm. you drank to excess oh, and yeah. you drank till you passed out, threw up um, or it was all gone. Um, there wasn't any moderation involved. And so that's how that's what I thought alcohol was about and being yeah. an adult. And that's what you did and yeah. then go into college. And then, of course, you know, it's just more. And so now I appreciate on college campuses with, you know, um, CRC, Collegiate Recovery Services, um, that, you you know, they will promote being sober and yeah. they, they have different programs because when I went, I, again, thought you drink as much as you can, as quick as you can, <laughs> yeah. and you wake up and you don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is familiar sound. <laughs> <laughs> And today I don't want to live like that. I want to live a healthy lifestyle. I want to wake up and remember, and I want to help others know that it's okay to say no and have a much more productive lifestyle. You know, as a, as some of the women I work with, their young moms, um, that it's okay. You don't have to drink. You need to learn how to deal with the stress in a healthy way. Yeah. And you know, instead of with the mommy wine and the mommy juice and all this, <laughs> oh, like, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean. Um, that stuff, young girls can just take that to the extreme and Mm -hmm. then it's too late. You're addicted to the substance and you need help. And it's, you know, it's now it's, it's normalizing to be able to get help. And there's a, there's a lot more out there. And especially here in Huntsville, the recovery community is, um, it's amazing. So there's lots and lots of resources here. Um, they just opened its uh, Ross, which is the recovery organization of support specialists. Okay. And they just opened a community center. Very cool. So yeah, you can go and hang out and there's meetings there. They have a computer lab, you nice. know, um, they serve two meals a day. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> you can't beat that. No. So you can meet other sober mind, you know, people that are also trying to stay sober. So I think that's very important to build a community. Oh, absolutely that was one of the things with me too just getting to know people going through the same thing and that's one of the reasons i'm so open about my sobriety is because if someone hears that maybe they can be like uh Oh, okay. You can do that. That's actually possible. You exactly. Can. There's all these anonymous organizations, but for me, I choose to not be anonymous because how is anybody supposed to find help? You know, yeah. people know that they can call me and I will help them in the right direction because for me, trying to find help was a problem, yeah. you know, and it's, I, Luckily, there was the Internet and I was able to find some meetings. But to actually nowadays be able to reach out to a person um, that's open and that that it's possible, that recovery is possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I always thought it was weird. It's one of the few things you have with alcohol. People are it's okay for people to be like, why don't you drink? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, what what does it matter to you, man? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. What does that matter? (laughs) 
And and that's, you know, nowadays it doesn't matter. But I didn't tell a lot of my friends that I was trying to quit drinking because mm-hmm. I didn't want to disappoint myself yeah. and I didn't want to be questioned about it. But then I noticed nobody cared if I was drinking or not drinking. They were all, you know, about their own business. Sure, yeah. And it's fine. Other people can, you know, maybe they can have a couple glasses of wine at dinner mm-hmm. and be fine. But that wasn't for me. That wasn't yeah. my experience. Exactly. That's that's kind of the same way I look at it. I mean, I don't if someone's not hurting any anybody, that's that's their thing. But I can't I can't live like right. that. That's not so how if I you, work. If you know, if a friend has had, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight DUIs, you might mm-hmm. want to think about your drinking yeah. and reassess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, like I feel very fortunate that I never, you know, hurt somebody um, yeah. with drinking and driving. And I wouldn't want to test that theory out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've both been lucky and I'm I'm thankful for that. Um, And that's I love my life now. And I love that being able to, you know, photograph the people that I did 30 years ago. And like with the Grateful Dead, you know, photographing them through the 90s and now Mm -hmm. photographing Dead and Company and bringing my life full circle. Things that I did when um, my life was strange yeah and wild and wacky um and i'm lucky i survived through it and you know now being able to help people and put a different spin on things and now i mean i remember everything and yeah you know, exactly it's, and and it's it's easy it's not a struggle it's not a struggle to get up in the morning i love getting up in the morning yeah yeah it's you actually experience things now and uh yeah it's I can be present and stay in the moment and enjoy people and enjoy what I'm doing. Whereas before I was escaping with social anxiety, being in certain situations, I was drinking, um, you know, to, you know, I'm around a whole bunch of celebrities and I'm trying to photograph them. And it was just a social lubricant, you know, and then all of a sudden it becomes a habit and, you know, then it's a sloppy habit and, you know, and not fun anymore. And so, you know, now, um, learning as an adult, you know, how to handle social anxiety and different things yeah. without, um, you know, without drugs or alcohol. Yeah. I, I got to say, I'll be honest with you when I, you know, for a while there, I, I was playing a lot and with my band and I was drinking a lot. I mm-hmm. would play shows and not even remember mm-hmm. playing the show. I knew that I played it, but I didn't remember it at all. It was just complete blackout. So when I got sober, I tried to edge my way into playing shows again, you know, because music is part of who I am. But that first show, I was terrified. It's awkward. Yeah, it <laughs> felt so awkward. And I'm awkward and I roll with it usually. But this was a different kind of awkward because you get so used to having that as your crutch, your mm-hmm. confidence booster thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, it's, so that that was probably one of my biggest challenges. And also you realize how many people in your life are just around you for that sort of fair weather friend, like mm-hmm. with the party and oh, you're yeah. like, wait, where's all my <laughs> friends? Oh, <laughs> so that's one of the two of the things, but you, you get past that and you, you meet people that help you and that are going through the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that's really what helped me and just getting to the root of everything Yes, with what's causing that. Yeah. I mean, and most people do have some form of trauma in their life and that is, you know, causing to, you know, act out in different ways and whether it's prescription drugs, um, you know, illegal drugs, um, alcohol, which is, you know, available everywhere now. And, yeah. and now with all the, you know, Delta eight and the different dispensaries and things, mm. it's a whole, it's a whole new set of problems. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I try to, I know there's some people look at alcohol as this or that, but it's all addiction. So Mm -hmm. it is all addiction. Um, And alcohol is just the, you know, sometimes that's the easiest thing for people to get. Mm -hmm. And I know alcohol was one of the first things I had. And then after everything else, um, it was the last thing, you know, because it was the easiest thing to get and most available and socially acceptable. And again, using it to celebrate and using it when you're sad and just all the different um, circumstances. Yeah. And plus working in bars, you know. Oh, yeah, is, yeah, uh, exactly. It, it, I sort of took a time off of doing that to kind of reconfigure my uh, internal, whatever you want to call it, brain, whatever's left in there and uh, <laughs> make that work. But, you know, this is kind of a, a weird story, but I, I don't know why this reminded me of that. But I went to Maine one time on a trip for work. 
And I remember it being so beautiful there with the lighthouses mm-hmm. and the beautiful like beach, rocky beaches and stuff. And this lady was like taking us all around, kind of giving us a tour. And I'm like, it's so beautiful here. And like, I can't find anything wrong with it. Doesn't anything bad ever happen? They were like, well, we have a real bad problem with bath salts here. Oh. I was like, I was like oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't, that's the last thing I expected okay. to hear. So I was just, that that was well, funny, but also tragic. But Yeah, kinda. like the drugs are everywhere, but it's these things that um, kids get addicted to or cause, you know, um, irreversible damage, whether it's having an accident, you know, hurting themselves oh, or yeah. someone else for things, this bath salts, um, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and different kind of gas station pills and, and these Delta eight pins and things that people really think are, you know, not going to harm them. Yeah. yeah, Cause they sort of, a lot of those uh, places, I know they sort of just try to skirt the law just Mm -hmm. enough to get it out there (laughs) and then they're still dangerous. Yeah. So it's a little, um, that is one thing here in Huntsville is these gas stations that find it a little frustrating, um, that all these things that they sell to, you know, young people and the people don't realize how addictive certain things are. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. That, that is, that is uh, dangerous. I, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been sober for a while, but it seems like that's so mm-hmm. common now. Like you say, mm-hmm. it's more and more lately. And that's what, you know, um, helping people learn to love the life that they have so they don't need anything like that or, you know, don't even want to try anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't even get that. <laughs> those. Uh, just, that say, DNA just say no. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But. I've been there, you know, is you just you're looking for a way to kill that pain uh, and you don't even know what you're doing. But then it's your your DNA kicks in. And like, Hey, I like that. Hey, I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Hey, you I are. like that too much. Hey, you're probably going to die soon. <laughs> so, yeah. And people do. And that's what, you know, it's uh, to bring everything down a notch. I mean, there's um, one young woman that I worked with mm. and uh, she just recently um, has passed away oh, and so sorry you know to hear and that. but that's here in Huntsville I mean you know overdoses happen every day I mean yeah. it is a reality and as Huntsville's growing um, there's going to be more of that and more of mm-hmm. the homelessness and more of you know uh, the violence and big city big city problems yeah absolutely but the good news is I mean um, best life has you know I mean is a one Wonderful environment and helping eight women at a time. And when women graduate, they come back to the program and they still come to our meetings and, you know, continue to help the new women that are there. And so really fostering a community of women, helping other women and women that, you know, want to hang around other sober women and do sober activities. And, you know, you don't have to have the the well now they have all kinds of things that you can put wine in but you don't have to have you know the the bra with the wine tube in it when you go hiking (laughs) yeah i wear those all the time (laughs) i can picture i can see that (laughs) (laughs) but um and i'm sure it's uh you know i i've I'm not a woman, obviously, <laughs> but like I, I've heard that it can be a very vulnerable, it's a vulnerable place for me as a man when I got sober, but I know that it's probably, it's good to have that feel safe in that environment with, with just yes. ladies and just. And that's what I really wanted to provide a safe environment because most women come from trauma and there's yeah. different reasons why people have gotten, you know, into addiction, but having a safe space with other women trying to, you know, build their, their new lives in recovery. Recovery. I think that's great. And you say it's just that you're taking it one step further by offering them that safe space. And, you know, so I think that's great and much needed and greatly appreciated. Um, but yeah, man, this has been great. We've <laughs> see, we've gone the gambit. We got like really goofy <laughs> and we got really serious and like we kind of went up and down on this. It was a roller coaster ride. It is. It was a long, strange trip. <laughs> it is. It always is when you're around one of us. So that's just typical. Well, um, let's see. Oh, I was going to talk about you have your photos in an event for a little orange fish. Yes. Which is an. Uh, which is a, a nonprofit organization that helps with mental health issues yes. for the community. Yes. Um, so that's this Friday at uh, the shed at Stove House. And um, I'm going to have a 
picture of one of the women from my program from Best Life and some of her words as to what the pictures are. But I kind of took it along the lines of, you know, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. And um, and it has to do with, you know, the mental health, um, how things, you know, with mental health and addiction, just making bad choices and, you know, bad life decisions and living an unhealthy lifestyle. And then what happened to make things change. And then what it's like now, which is, you know, living a healthy lifestyle and, and working on trauma and, you know, giving back to the community. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's a great organization too. And I, you know, I've heard that they do great work and, uh, I was going to say what, so I know it's this Friday, but what, it's a free event what? and it's from five to 10. Five to ten. Um, yes. At the shed at stove house. And there's going to be, um, artwork, um, that will be for sale and the money will go, um, be donated to the organization, the, um, inside out studio artist, which is also here at low mill. Cool. They're going to have work there and there's going to be musicians and there will be food and nice. it'll be, um, just a, a great event to come support. Um, you know, uh, Daniel who has little orange fish, um, support the community. Community. That's great. Um, what? Let's see, I know it's Friday. What specific date is that? I, I could look at my calendar. I think it's the twentieth. Twenty. Okay. The twentieth. So because, this probably because won't microwave come out. Dave Day is on oh, the twenty second. Yeah. Our so buddy, that's everybody's Sunday. buddy, yeah. microwave yes. Dave. Yes, and I will be photographing the event. Oh, nice. So There's another for yeah. for several years in a row now. I've been the photographer, and so I'm very excited. That's awesome. And I got to get Dave on here too. Yes. I've been meaning to do that. He's such a cool guy. <laughs> and this is where like all the women from the house will be volunteering and again you can go to events and do things and you can do it um clean and sober that's awesome i love it <laughs> i'm all about it <laughs> well um man stephanie it's been great having you on and thank you once again for letting me invade your photography studio in here uh, well i'm glad you're here i'm look, glad you set up yeah look at you, all your freak pictures and we we've only got a few in here she's got a, a nice collection of them and you do incredible work and just such a amazing story that you have and i know we've only scratched the surface talking about it today but definitely if you're uh if you can come around out here to uh, Low Mill in Huntsville, Alabama, if you're around in October, she's got these, uh, your freak show pictures and you, not just the Jim Rose sideshow, but also some other, you said this was in Tuscaloosa. Oh yeah, some, some of them are for Tuscaloosa. Some of them are from other real sideshows when wow. they used to tour um, okay. with fairs back in the day. Um, but also I will continuously have um, different exhibits up cool. with the music and with local and national artists and awesome. things will be for sale for the holidays, November and December. And there's just a lot going on at the mill, but for October, it is the Freak Festival here. Um, it's, you know, Halloween. That's so right. Got to get those freaks out. You got to. <laughs> <laughs> Goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there a certain way if, if someone wants to find out more about uh, your photography studio or, you know, the the. Uh, Best the life. Best life. Thank you. <laughs> you you um, know what I'm thinking. Yes, yes. So for my photography, um, SEJ Photo Alabama on Instagram and Facebook. And I'm pretty, um, you know, out loud and um, about my recovery. So you can find there's Best Life Recovery um, on Facebook and on Instagram. And you can call me personally. Um, my profile's public. And you can even find me, you know, at Low Mill Studio. Studio 2018. And, um, you know, I'm here when Low Mill's open. And if I'm not because I'm out shooting, you can put a note on the door. But I am, you know, I'm always open to anybody contacting me um, through Facebook um, or they can call me. My number's all over Facebook. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate how open you are about that. And I know, I know you, 
like I say before, you've helped a lot of people, so it's very Thank admirable. Uh, but is there anything else you got that I want to say at the end um, here? Well, I'm just, well, I'm very excited that Best Life Recovery has officially its nonprofit status. Um, oh, yeah. We just celebrated our open house and fundraiser. So um, we are a nonprofit. So uh, you can go online and see our Venmo and the, the items that we always need, the necessities that we need at the house to keep it running daily um, because it is a safe, sober living environment for women, but it's also also at an affordable cost That's so in order to do that um, yeah. we need you know we need people's donations definitely and that's that's definitely a worthy cause so yeah i highly recommend donating if you can it'd be awesome thank you and that's my photography goes to support it oh very cool <laughs> okay well hey stephanie thank you so much for being on here and hey we'll we'll see you around next time and i am tony purdue and uh, like if you like what we are hearing on the podcast or you may be watching the video version be mm -hmm. sure to subscribe to the youtube channel or you know tell your friends like i say tell your friends tell your family tell your enemies make them suffer by having to hear my voice <laughs> you know i'm like an audio scarecrow for your for your ears so <laughs> now hopefully i'm like honey like molasses pouring out molasses on your cereal in the morning it's the best analogy i can think of so uh, thank you all so much, and we appreciate it, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.